In this video, we're looking at a diagonally launched projectile motion problem. Um, instead of just a horizontal launch, this is launched over and up or at an angle. And so we'll see how to break that problem down um, in this video. So let's take a look at this problem. Um, we've got some information about a student who's launching a projectile from the top of a building and it's gonna land somewhere here to the right. Now there's lots of questions we can ask and then answer about this. And we're gonna answer all of these in this video. One, how long did it take the ball to rise before it came back down? What was the ball's maximum height it got to? How long did it remain in the air? Um, how far from the base of the building um, did the ball land? And then two more advanced problems. Um, how fast was the ball moving when it struck the ground? And then what angle was it moving at when it finally hit the ground? It's changing angles as it goes. What was that final angle? So we'll be able to answer all of that um, in this problem. So let's get started. I'm going to take those questions off. Um, just so we have a little bit more room to work here and we'll just solve for all the things we can and then we'll go back and answer those questions with the information we have. Now, anytime we do a projectile motion problem, I always start by splitting up um, the problem into vertical component and horizontal component. Even before I read all of the problem, I'm going to list out the variables I'm going to need. Acceleration, initial velocity, and initial position for both the vertical and the horizontal. So let's read this problem. A student fires a cannonball diagonally with a speed of 29 meters per second. Now I'm going to color code this blue for vertical, red for horizontal. But if you notice, I underline speed of 29 meters per second in black. It's not vertical or horizontal. And so I'm going to label that on here. Um, and I'm going to make that arrow um, black so that we know that's neither horizontal nor, nor vertical. Um, that's the speed that it's moving diagonally at that angle, 29 meters per second. That's our velocity from a height of 68 meters. I underline that in blue, that's gonna be a vertical distance, and I'm gonna label that down on my diagram. That's the distance from the bottom or the ground up to the launch height of the cannon, kind of to the top of the cannon right there. Um, I'm gonna draw a free body diagram for this to help us identify our accelerations here. Um, the projectile, once it's left the cannon, we're not interested in the actual you know, shot of the cannon, um, you know, of, of shooting this out. We're interested in once it's in the air, what's going on when it's a projectile. Um, and so we've got gravity downward. It says to neglect drag. Now there's some cases where we would, we could not neglect the drag. For example, um, an airplane taking off because the airplane is going to use the lift force from the drag in order to lift it up off the ground. Or another example would be a paper airplane where it's kind of tossed by the forces of, of air resistance and lift. And so in this case, um, a cannonball though, that drag is gonna have a pretty small effect. And so we're gonna, we're gonna neglect that or not include that. So our only force acting on this projectile is gravity downward. So that means a couple things. If gravity is your only vertical force and you're here on earth, your acceleration is gonna be negative 9.8 meters per second every second. In other words, as it's rising, it's slowing down by 9.8 meters per second every second. And as it's falling, it's gonna speed up by 9.8 meters per second every second that it falls. Um, the next thing is horizontally. Look, there's no horizontal forces. We could also say the forces horizontally are balanced. And if that's the case where forces are balanced, our velocity is constant. And if our velocity is constant, by definition, our acceleration is zero. In other words, our velocity is not changing horizontally. That's gonna always be the case in these projectile motion problems where we're neglecting air resistance. All right, um, next thing, let's identify that initial height. So I'm gonna define the ground as y equals zero. And if I follow that up, that means that this height right here is 68 meters. So I'm gonna label that as my initial height. And then horizontally, we'll start with the zero here at the base of the building, and then we'll go over to the right um, and label that x equals zero here. And we don't know what this distance is that final x position, we're gonna solve for that in this problem. And um, so our initial position is just zero meters. All right, now the next thing we need to identify is what are our horizontal and vertical initial velocities? That's a little bit trickier. The answer is not 29 for either of those though. We will use 29 to determine what those are. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw this vector, but I'm gonna resolve it into a horizontal component and then a vertical component. So I'm gonna have a dotted line arrow to the right. And I did that in red because that's a horizontal component of that velocity. In other words, this is moving up into the right 29 meters per second. 
This represents, though, how fast is it moving to the side? It's not moving 29 meters per second to the side. Imagine there's a sun overhead casting a shadow down and you're seeing that shadow move along the ground. It's not moving 29 meters, meters per second. It's gonna be moving a little bit slower than that. We're gonna calculate what that speed is. We're gonna call that velocity initial in the horizontal or X direction. Initial velocity in the horizontal direction. And we're gonna label another arrow going up um, and that's gonna be initial velocity in the vertical direction, VIY. Now notice I drew these in such a way that it makes a right triangle. Um, I extended this one out to where it's directly below the tip of that you know, resultant vector, the 29 meters per second, and then I do this one up. So we've got a right angle here, and we've got our 67 degree angle right there. Now, because this is a right triangle, we can use trig to solve for what are these horizontal and vertical velocities that we need in order to solve our problem. So we're gonna use trig, I'm gonna write out so ka toa, and we're gonna use sine, and we're gonna use cosine to find both of those. Let's go and do the um, vertical first. We're gonna use sine for that, and um, it may be helpful to go ahead and identify what these um, sides are. Our angle is right here that we're working with, and so opposite of that angle is this right here, so I'm gonna label that opposite. Um, we've got this side right here, which is next to the angle. This one's also next to the angle, but that's going to be our hypotenuse. It's across from our right angle right here. So that's our hypotenuse. And then this is going to be our adjacent because it's right next to that 67 degrees. So I'm going to write adjacent right there, and then I can label this our hypotenuse. Okay, great. So let's use sine to solve for VIY. I'm going to write out sine of and then put our angle, 67 degrees, equals opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite VIY over hypotenuse, 29 meters per second. And then I'm just gonna solve for VIY here. I'm gonna multiply by 29 meters per second on both sides, and I get VIY equals 29 meters per second times sine of 67 degrees. Make sure your calculator is in degrees. Um, and let's substitute those things in, and we should get 26.7 meters per second. That's gonna be our initial vertical velocity. In other words, when it's first released from the cannon, that's how quickly it's rising upward. Um, its overall velocity is 29. This number is a little bit less than that, which is a good sign that, I, that we have a correct value there. If we got a number that was greater than 29, that couldn't be the case because that hypotenuse has to be the greatest value. So it's rising 26.7 meters per second. We're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna use cosine to solve for our adjacent side, which is our initial velocity horizontally. In other words, how fast is it moving to the side when it's launched? So I'm gonna do this one a little bit quicker. Cosine of 67 degrees equals adjacent over hypotenuse VIX over 29. All right, I wanna multiply by 29 meters per second on both sides, and I'll get VIX equals 29 meters per second times cosine of 67. Plug those in, and we get VIX is 11.3 meters per second. That's how fast it's moving to the side when it's launched. Now that number is smaller than the number we got for the vertical, but if we look at these vectors here, the horizontal component vector is shorter than the vertical component vector. And that's because it's not moving to the side as fast as it's rising when it's first launched. That's because that angle there is greater than 45. Um, all right, so our initial velocity in the horizontal is 11.3 meters per second. All right, great. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start with our vertical to solve for our flight time. Um, sometimes you could have a problem where you use the horizontal to find the flight time. That would be if you knew this distance right here already, but we don't. We're gonna use the vertical. That's what we'll usually do to find a flight time. And I'm going to substitute in for all the constants here. Y or our height is not a constant. That's going to change over time. It rises and then falls. That's changing. Our initial height, though, is going to be the same. Even as it goes up and back down, it still started at 68 meters above the ground. So we're going to plug in for our constants. That's a constant there. Y equals 68 plus our initial velocity vertically is a constant, 26.7. Now our velocity is changing but our initial, our starting velocity is was the same, even as our actual velocity changes. Times t, time is changing, time is passing, plus one half 
at squared. Our acceleration is negative, don't forget the negative, 9.8 meters per second squared times time squared. Don't forget t and don't forget the squared there. All right, we're going to go to Desmos and we're going to graph this and we're going to write down several values we find from the graph in Desmos. Here in Desmos, I'm going to go ahead and type in our equation, y equals 68 plus 26.7 t plus 1 half times negative 9.8 t squared, and we get um, a parabola here. So let's zoom over and scroll out here. And it's, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on, but if we resize, I always resize my axes here. Let's do from x equals 0, in other words, a time of 0, to it looks like it's going to hit the ground somewhere around 7.5. Let's go to 10 then. Um, Oh, this is looking good. All right, so I'm going to zoom over a little bit. Now, there's some interesting points I want to point out here. The first one's where it crosses the y-axis. That's a familiar number, 68. It was in our equation. And what this point means is that when the time was 0, so at the very beginning of the launch, the height was 68, 0, 68. And that's true. That was our starting height. Great. If that doesn't match, then I would be worried. So it rises for a while, and it's going to hit, hit its kind of maximum high, and then it's going to fall back down over time. And let's look at this point here, 7.34 comma 0. In other words, when 7.34 seconds have passed, the height is 0. Now, when the height is 0, that's when it hits the ground. So this right here is our flight time. Let's write that down. 7.34 seconds is the amount of time it takes for it to rise, and then come back down and hit the ground. Now, the nice thing about the graph is that we can really easily find the maximum height and the time it took to get to that maximum height. We just look at the vertex of our parabola. I'm going to click that point, and that's time comma height, meaning that after 2.724 seconds have passed, it reached a maximum height of 104.37 meters. It's not going to get any higher than that. It's about to start falling. So we know our maximum height, and we know how long it was rising for. Now we'll take that information that we just solved for and substitute that time into our horizontal um, position equation. So I'm going to rewrite out that horizontal position equation. I'm just going to substitute in values I know, 0 and 0. Those terms will just become 0. And then we're, we know our initial velocity, 11.3. We know our flight time is 7.34. We'll multiply those together and we'll get a final position of 82.9 meters. And that means that 7.34 seconds, that's where it's going to land. It's at a horizontal position of 82.9 meters. Let's go back to our questions real quick and answer the ones that we can. So how long did the ball rise for? Well, it was rising for 2.72 seconds. What was the ball's maximum height? Well, it got to that maximum height of 104.4 meters. How long did the ball remain in the air? In other words, that's our flight time. Our flight time was 7.34 seconds. How far from the base of the building did the ball land? Well, that was this 82.9 meters. That's how far it traveled horizontally. And then we've got two more questions. How fast was it moving when it struck the ground? And what angle did the ball land at? These I would consider a little bit more advanced problems. Um, but we're going to go ahead and do those in this video. But a lot of times for my students, I kind of stop at that, I would consider this kind of uh, some, some, some harder problems that we can answer here. So let's take a look at it though. Um, we'll use some trig for this um, as well here. The first thing we want to know is how fast was the ball moving as it struck the ground? To know that, we need to know what's its vertical velocity and its horizontal velocity whenever it hits the ground. So let's start with vertical. I'm going to do this in blue. Our final velocity equals our initial velocity plus at. You could start with a equals delta v over delta t, and you could solve for this equation using that. I'm not going to do that right now, but that's kind of where this comes from. Our final velocity equals initial plus acceleration times time. Let's find what that final velocity would be. Our initial velocity vertically was 26.7. Our acceleration is negative 9.8. Our flight time was 7.34. So our final velocity in the vertical direction was negative 45.2 meters per second. The negative makes sense because it was rising, but at the end it's going to be falling or moving downward. So we get a negative value there. Horizontally, this one's easy. Our acceleration is zero horizontally. And so that final velocity, it's still moving horizontally. 
11.3 meters per second. So I'm going to take those two velocities, 45.2 down, 11.3 to the right, and I'm going to write those as component vectors. I'm going to label that negative 45.2, 11.3 in the positive direction, and I'm going to write a resultant vector right here. Now from here, we're going to pull out our old friend Pythagoras and solve for that hypotenuse there. Square this plus square this, take the square root of both sides. I'm going to do that kind of quickly here. I'm going to assume you know how to solve um, for a variable in the Pythagorean theorem. You're going to get a final velocity of 46.6 .6 meters per second. We'll write that there as our answer to that question. Now, it's moving a lot faster when it hits the ground than when it was launched, but that's because it traveled up. It had a long time to fall and to pick up speed and eventually be moving 46.6 .6 meters per second. The last question, what angle with the horizontal did the ball land? So it was launched at an angle of 67. I would expect that it should be a steeper angle because as it has more time, it's falling faster. That angle is going to be um, getting a little bit larger kind of with the ground there. And so what we'll do is we'll use um, an inverse trig function because we know the sides now, but what we don't know is this angle. Normally in a regular trig function, we know the angle and we're trying to find a side. Now we know the sides, we're trying to find an angle. So we use inverse trig function. We'll use tangent for that. And that'll always be the case whenever you know these two components because it's opposite and adjacent. So I'm gonna take inverse tangent of, instead of the angle, I'm gonna put the ratio, the opposite over the adjacent in the case of tangent. Opposite is 45.2 over 11.3. I'm gonna ignore the negative sign whenever I do this because um, we'll take a look at, the, I mean, the angle here depends on the situation of the problem, not on the, the math of it. So we'll leave out the negative there. Equals, so I wanna put that into the calculator, sometimes called arctan, um, 45.2 over 11.3. Make sure you're in degrees, and we should get an angle of 76.0 degrees. I'm gonna put that 76 degrees right there. Now, technically, all of my answers should have been in two sig figs if I'm following sig fig rules, because our, our number here only had two. Same as there and there, I included three sig figs in most of these, um, but that angle is gonna be 76 degrees. So that's how you do a um, diagonally launched projectile problem and all of the different kinds of questions that we could answer about that um, trajectory um, and that launch. So hopefully this is helpful and have a great day.